Hello and welcome to this month's um, self-care webinar. So specifically it's focused around eight self-care mistakes that those legal professionals like us tend to make, um, but it's all around the topic of self-care and I often say to people it, it's a topic I didn't talk about with lawyers for years um, because it just seemed like a bit of a uh, a fluffy topic, if you like, um, too soft, maybe, for us as hardened legal professionals. Um, but the concept is always, the concept I've always understood how very important that is. And with anybody that I've been supporting or working with, the idea of looking after themselves is point one. You know, whatever it is, I want a promotion, I want to change jobs, I don't know if I want this career anymore, I want to deal with my stress or my burnout or, or my relationship problems, whatever it is, the first point I always start out with them, even if it's business, um, working on their business, is what are you doing to take care of yourself? Because only when we take care of ourselves that we can make good decisions. Um, so it really is the place to start. But I have started talking about self-care now because it has become, uh, I think, far more acceptable in the language and, and everybody understands what we're talking about. So there we go. Um, they seem to have, they seem to be a popular topic. So I've opened with this quote here that self-care is your fuel. Whatever the road ahead or the path you've taken, self-care is what keeps the motor running and your wheels turning. So um, I, I like that. I think that sums it up nicely. Um, so for, for those who are here and those who catch the recording, one thing I want you to have a think about is where do you think your greatest challenge is around your self-care right now? And often it can look like one of these. It can look like either I'm just too busy for it, um, I'm a strong independent professional, I really don't need it. Now, you might know that that's not true. I mean, I doubt you would even be listening to this sort of presentation if, if you really believe that. But even though logically your brain might say, no, you know, I know that's not true. Deep down in your psyche, because it's been with us for years, um, not just in our legal careers, but probably even going back generationally, um, you know, th there could still be quite a lot of that belief being carried around. So it's quite useful for you to know before you start trying to look at your self-care, um, what is your challenge around it? So is, is it deep down somewhere a belief that actually, no, I should be this strong professional, therefore I don't need it? Um, or is it number three? It's selfish. I've got so many other demands on my time and or on my money. Um, you know, what I used to see this look like with people was, um, say, women who worked pretty much full time during the week and they have, have a family. So they would say, I can't possibly do anything for myself at the weekend because I have to spend all that time at the weekend with my family because I'm not with them all week. Um, so, you know, it could, could sound like something like that. Or it could be number four. I love the idea of it. You know, I get it, Hannah. You're talking about it. I, I agree with you. It's really important. But where on earth do I start? All the training I've ever done has only been in relation to my legal career. Um, you know, maybe I even have a personal trainer for, my, you know, the physical parts of, of me, maybe. Um, but I've got no idea where to start with some of this. Um, or is it that I'm exhausted um, and I just can't think about it, which, again, um, is true for a lot of people. We are still all carrying lots of exhaustion from the pandemic years, the stress levels that everybody was put under. I mean, we went through something that, you know, we've never gone through in our lifetime and we will probably never, well, who knows if we'll go through it again, but we certainly never had before. Um, so the stress levels that were raised, we're still carrying so much of that and so much exhaustion, even from those years, never mind what's happened in the last year or two for, for people. Um, so it could be that you're so exhausted you can't think about it. So have a think about which of those categories you fall into. And what I always encourage people to do when they're listening to this session is, if you were to think about your self-care on a scale of one to 10, you know, one being um, uh, not at all, really, or even zero um, and 10 being, yep, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm all in for self-care. I do all these things for myself. You know, there's nothing else I could be doing for myself. I mean, I'm in great condition that way. Um, you know, think about where you would be on that scale of one to 10. Um, and when I first started doing these webinars a few months ago, I remember putting myself at about a five or a six. Um, and I thought that was, you know, for someone who trains on this, that felt low. Um, but at the time, I think um, I wasn't really getting any exercise. Um, I wasn't really very pleased with my diet and things. Um, and interestingly, since I did the first workshop, what I realized that I was missing was, was friendships, friends. I've been so busy the last year, really. 
that my sort of certainly friendships with with my older friends from school and things I just hadn't seen them so after the webinar I literally made a point of, of arranging dinner and literally two days later spending loads of time with friends which was just wonderful and and what I needed to do and I don't think if had I not done this session I wouldn't have realized that's what I was missing so think about on that scale of one to ten where you are as I said I put myself um, in that first webinar at about five or six and it was interesting that I had some threes and fours I had some minuses um so yeah it's it's think about where you are and what because what I'd like you to do as we go through this session is think about where you are now and then think about what one action might you take as a result of what we're talking about today to take you up one notch so if you're at a three or a four what might you do to just get to a five or if you're at a minus two what might you do to get you up to to zero or to one you know just to move yourself up one little notch that's what we're thinking about here really um so if if you don't know me um my name is hannah becko i'm a commercial property lawyer um have done that for about 20 odd years um and about seven years ago when i was what i now know was chronic stress and the edge of burnout um, I went off and discovered how I could keep going because I had a legal business by that point that I'd been running for three or four years. I didn't really want to lose it all or throw it all away. Um, and by that point, I'd got, you know, new house, new cars, promised my husband I was going to pay for all this. So, you know, had I let it all go, it would have been almost more stressful because how would I have paid for it all? Um, but I had to find ways to get through. I had to find ways to deal with the chronic stress and avoid the burnout so that I could keep going. Um, not just keep going, but change it in a way that it worked for me, because I couldn't just keep going indefinitely um, the way I was. Um, so what I went away and learned um, completely changed my, my life and my business over the next sort of nine to 12 months and has continued to since then. So not only was that great for me, but I realized that other legal professionals needed to know this stuff as well. I had to go outside the law. Luckily, I had found a coach and a mentor um, who, who worked with women business owners, and I could go and learn it from them. But within the law, there was none of this. There was nowhere I could go to for, for support and, and how to, to get out of the position I was in. And that's why I created Authentically Speaking. So there is now a place, um, you know, run by a lawyer, still practicing. All my contacts are lawyers. And yet I've got all of that um, knowledge and, and skills that I've built up around this area as well. Um, I have got three boys who are 13, nine and five. Um, and I'm also head of mission at a little firm called Legal Studio, who's based in Leeds, and I look after our Manchester office. Um, so that is me. So what we're going to talk about today is um, identifying what self-care means to us, identifying where we are on that scale of one to ten, as I say. Um, we're going to have a look at the three pillars of self-care. And we're going to understand what stops us. And we've already started to think about that with that early slide. You know, what is our blocker? What's our belief? When we talk about self-care, what does our, our mind or our body go? Oh, no, because. And what's that reason? Because often it's unlocking that that's going to be really important to actually put into practice anything that we talk about today. And then looking at how we can improve our approach, potentially. That's what we're going to have a look at. So what is the problem with lawyers? Why do I, I mean, I know I work with lawyers. That's because I love them. It's because I am one. I'm married to one. All my friends are lawyers. All I know is, is, is law. It's what I've done for, for 20 years and two years of training before that. Um, so what is the problem with lawyers specifically? And this is very interesting. Now, when I click this slide on, I want you to um, be aware of your reaction. Um, you know, what does your mind immediately say when you see this image I'm about to show you? Now I've had varying responses in relation to this slide. Um, things like, I want to believe it, I'm trying to believe it, it feels uncomfortable. Um, I don't think I've ever had a, oh, hell yeah, I, uh, yes. Um, I don't think I've had that yet. Um, if I do get that, I suspect it will be from someone who has had quite a bit of personal development, um, coaching, support, done a lot of work on themselves would be my guess. Um, the most painful one I've had was I tolerate myself. Um, that was that that still hurts when I, I think ab about reading that when when somebody wrote that one. So think about how, how you feel when you see this. But really, it's it's to, to make my point that this is the problem with lawyers and self-care. 
I can tell you what to do. You probably know what to do. It's not rocket science, but we're not doing it. And the reason we're not doing it is we don't often even value ourselves enough. Um, you know, we value ourselves when we're doing work for clients, when we're billing, maybe when we're looking after our teammates or our, or, you know, the people we role model for, etc. We might value ourselves in doing that. We don't value ourselves inherently. And, and that's what, what the difficulty is. It's why we don't um, focus on self-care like we should. So I want you to have a think about what actually the word self-care means to you, because that's the other thing. There's why it's important, why it matters, and what is it? What does it actually mean? As I say, the phrase has been bandied about a lot. And often it can mean things like this to people. If you say to people, well, what's self-care? They'll say, oh, it's going for a meditation. It's going for a nice meal. It's sitting outside with a book in the sunshine, you know, massage, yoga, um, the, the, the two little pictures of the dogs. I thought that was sweet with the massage. You know, it's these sorts of things. That's what people say self-care means. Now, these are activities that you could do as part of your self-care. Um, I'm not saying they're not. And, you know, I love all of those things. Um, so they're activities that you could do, but they're not self-care in themselves. So what self-care can be, and, and I really like this diagram, because I think it really encompasses a lot of what we're talking about when we're talking about self-care. It can be, and I say as simple as, I don't mean it's simple, because for many of us sort of type A personalities, usually some of these things are really, really hard. Asking for help. Hard for personalities like us, but absolutely necessary if you're going to start to practice self-care. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy when you start doing it. It's still going to be hard and uncomfortable when you start doing it, but start doing it and it gets easier. Um, so asking for help, taking a step back, not take, not saying, I'll do it, I'll do it, not being the one who volunteers all the time, maybe taking that step back and just waiting to see who else might step into the space and might volunteer. Forgiving yourself, forgiving yourself for maybe. Um, when you start to think about some of this, looking back over, you know, however long it's been for you, 10, 20 years, whatever, and going, do you know what? I was really hard on myself for all those years, but but that, that, that's gone. That, that's gone now. We've got to forgive ourselves now and think about the future. It's definitely about saying no. Saying no. We tend to be yes people. We've got to start saying no more. Um, again, not easy, but but definitely doable. And my process, I always say to people, if you tend to be a yes person, you're not going to switch just from saying yes to everything to saying no. I mean, you can try, but for many, it's too hard. But what you can do is start to create space. So where you've always been a yes person, instead of just saying yes straight away, come up with a phrase, have it ready so you don't have to think about it. Something like can I check my diary and get back to you? Can I check my calendar and get back to you? Can I check my capacity for this week or next week and get back to you? Create the space. So again, it's just giving yourself time. Now you may ultimately still go back and say yes. You may go back and say no, it almost doesn't matter. You've created yourself a bit of space to actually look at this and go in the cold light of day, have I got time, energy, mental capacity to do that thing? Or actually, should I say no? Or should I say yes, but it will be in two weeks time or whatever. But also you've then, if people know you as being the yes person, you'll have started to change their expectations by opening that space. Suddenly, maybe you aren't going to say yes. And in which case, who might, they might have to start thinking about who their second person to ask might be or what their plan B might be. Um, so yeah, create space is, is my advice in relation to the saying no one. Staying at home sometimes. Sometimes it's about going out. Um, sometimes, you know, I was talking to, to one of my, um, the ladies I mentor, and, you know, I know she suffers with depression and anxiety. And so when she goes quiet for a little while, I check in because I know there could be something going on. Checked in with her and she said, yes, I am feeling tired and, and not feeling great about things. Um, I know I'll be fine, but I'm just not feeling great right now. She said, but I've got an event next week and I am going to it. And even if I, you know, don't feel like I really want to go to that event. I know I need to go. I need to go and be around people. So sometimes it's about going to the things. Sometimes it's about saying no to the things. It's about you deciding what you need at that time. Setting boundaries, 100%. We can, in this profession, be quite bad at setting boundaries. In fact, I've got a whole guide on avoiding burnout by setting boundaries. Um, uh, when I send out the, the, the bits and bobs after this session and, and in the notes and things, I can put access to that. So you can have a look at that guide as well. Asking for what you need. So instead of doing everything yourself, 
um, because I know you're brilliant and I know you can do it all yourself, but it doesn't mean you have to. Um, asking other people for what help they can provide. Um, starting to put yourself first. Now, again, super easy for me to say, just go and put yourself first. Not very easy for you to do. Um, when I started actually putting this into practice, took me about 18 months to really believe it. So for the first 18 months, I had to say, right, I know I need to take better care of myself. Chronic stress and burnout is not a thing I want to be doing. I don't want to be having panic attacks while I've got a two-year-old sleeping upstairs. That's not the sort of life I want or the sort of mother I want to be. Um, so I need to put myself first. But I didn't think I was worth enough to put myself first at that point. That's this journey that we're on. This is the, the bit about valuing ourselves that I talked about earlier. So what I had to do was say, I might not feel I'm worth it, but my kids certainly are. They are worth having a healthier, better mum. So I'll do it for them. And so for the first 18 months or so of me, you know, working on myself, as I've talked about, I wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for them. But the funny thing is that when you do start doing some of this work and looking after yourself, you start to realise that, yeah, it is for you. Yes, it's for other people, too, but it is for you as well. So, yes, do put yourself first. And I know, again, it's not easy in the beginning. So find another reason to do it. Use that powerful brain of yours to say, well, OK, who would I benefit if I were healthier, happier, more mentally resilient? Who would benefit from that that I care about? And let's do it for them. Let's start with them. And then spending time alone. I mean, this is one of my absolute needs. When you think about the things you absolutely need to function, I know that about two hours a week alone is what I need. And I certainly realised that when I had my third son and it went about four months before I had no any time to myself. And I just thought, why do I feel so ugh, wound up and everything? There's no reason for it, apart from the fact I'd had no uh, physical space away from another human being for months um, and again in lockdown the same sort of thing happened so I know for me that's a particularly important one um, so self-care this is my definition of self-care I think it's not all those pictures that we looked at it's not the meditation and the reading your book and the going for a nice meal self-care is putting yourself first more often than not in every decision you make so every time you have a decision to make oh can you take on this new case? Can you take on this new client? Can you pick my children up after school? Can you X, Y, Z? Every time you have that decision to make, stop and think about you first. Can I do it? Do I have the space, the time, the mental capacity to do it? Is there something in it for me? Let's even be selfish about this, you know? Um, think about you before you make that decision. That, that's, to me, what real self-care is. So the three pillars I want you to think about, we've got physical, emotional and spiritual. Physical, we all know about. We've been hearing about it for years. Eat your five fruit and veg a day, drink your eight glasses of water. Now it's walk your 10,000 steps, whatever it is. There's plenty out there about what we should do for our physical well-being. Um, our emotional and spiritual then is what I want us to talk about. But I do want to give you um three mistakes that we tend to make we know all about what the physical things are that we should do but we still make a load of mistakes in this area things like not making times for meals we will just be grabbing snacks it might be so late when we finish work or get home that we're just having something quick and easy that might not be healthy we might be drinking coffee throughout the day just to keep us going um we might not be getting enough sleep because we're working late into the night you know the amount of people I speak to who say, yes, you know, I get to pick my children up at three o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock in the afternoon. And then I log on about seven or eight and work till about 10, 11. Now I'm all for balance. And to me, balance is what works for you. So if not working in the afternoon and working in the evening works for you or working at the weekends because it's quieter and your other half has the children, brilliant. So long as it works for you, that's balance. It's choosing when to work. But when we're just constantly missing out on sleep and keep working late thinking, oh, well, I'll catch up with sleep at some other point that never happens. And that's really bad for our health. You know, there is so much research out there that says prolonged lack of sleep is worse for us than smoking. So we really do need to prioritize getting enough sleep, um, meaning to get to the gym or the yoga class or out for the walk. Um, but it's the first thing to go from the diary when we're um, when we're busy. So those are some of the mistakes we make there. What about emotional so the emotional mistakes we tend to make is cancelling on friends and family because, again, we're too busy. 
the amount of times I did this as a junior lawyer. I, I worked in Manchester and my friends from school would commute into Manchester for an hour to meet me for dinner. And I was late. And sometimes I cancelled on them. I mean, it's terrible, isn't it? Terrible friend. And they, they you know, they're still around, bless them. Great. They are great friends. Um, so, yeah, cancelling dinner dates, being late, etc. I, I also know when I worked, um, there were a number of lawyers I worked with who'd missed concerts and things. You know, they'd bought concert tickets. They're A, quite expensive. And B, you're usually quite keen to go and see your favourite bands and things, aren't you? And they'd just not go because they were too busy. Um, stopping hobbies or can't remember what you even used to enjoy because you don't have time. Um, ignoring that gut feeling with clients that you don't really want to work with or potentially working in a, in a place or in an environment or in a culture that doesn't gel with you and your values. Now, I know upping and quitting is not, you know, always an option for people at all. But you can if you realize that that's where you are and that's how you feel, you can start thinking about it to maybe make a change six or 12 months down the line. Um, but to even realize that why you're feeling um you know, not not feeling brilliant is because of that environment, you know, that that's a really important thing to realize if that's the case for you. And then think about, you know, are there changes I could make within the environment? Could I influence some change? Um, or, or is it that actually I need to start thinking about my future somewhere else, um, potentially? So some spiritual mistakes we make. Um, now, spirit by spiritual here, I don't necessarily mean religious. For some people, it is. Um, but, you know, it, it's just whatever connects you to, you know, the universe, Mother Nature, whatever it is, whatever it is for you, the bigger, the more. Um, so things like having no time for meditation or journaling, even though you might have heard from me or from lots of other people just how brilliant it is. Meditation is. You know, that's how I got out of chronic stress and burnout was a regular 10 minute meditation every day. Um, so you know, I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, but even, you know, making that 10 minutes a day. Uh, journaling is also really, really powerful. Just literally getting a pen and paper and dumping out whatever's in your head onto a piece of paper. Really useful for clearing the mind and reducing stress. Um, feeling disconnected as though you're alone. You know, this is where our independence comes from. Well, nobody else could do it as well as us. If they could, they'd just have our jobs. Um, if they don't do it as well as me, I'm just going to have to come behind them and do it again anyway. So it's going to take me more time. You know, all this, I must do it myself. Whereas actually, you know, if you do lean into whether it's meditation, journaling, whatever it is for you, there is a bigger we're not alone. Um, there is more support out there than um, than we realise sometimes. So with all this, where do you start? You know, where do you go to get from that whatever number you gave yourself out of 10 to the next level? What do you do next? So I want you to have a think about it like this. Um, and you can always get a piece of paper and draw this wheel out. These are the eight different areas that are thought to make up a, you know, balanced, content life, if you like. Um, so you've got your spiritual side, your career, finances, uh, family, health, fun, friends and personal development. You'll see vari variations on this, but it, it's the idea is the same. And what I would suggest you do is you think about draw this wheel out and think about how satisfied you are in relation to each of those areas. Now, right in the center is a zero and right out at the edge of the circle is 10. So you've got one to 10 levels of satisfaction that you have in each of those areas. So the idea is you think about, for example, your health and say, right, how satisfied do I feel about my health right now? Well, you know, I do a bit, but I could always do more. So I'm probably at about a four or a five. So you just draw a line sort of, you know, about halfway into that segment at about four or five. And then say it was career and you said, yep, do you know what? I've been going full pelt on my career for the last few years. I'm really pleased with where I am. And similarly with my finances, because as my career's done well, my finances have done well. You know, you might be at around an eight or a nine or something around that wheel. So fill that in. And what that will do is show you in a snapshot, in a visual sense, which I always think is more powerful because it gets to that subconscious part of our mind. Um, show you in a visual sense where you are satisfied in life and where there could be a little bit of work to do. And what I'd suggest is that you don't try and work on all of them because that won't work. Choose one. And maybe it's going to be your lowest one. Or maybe it's one that you think, actually, if I worked on that area, I think that would improve a few of them. Um, so choose one, maybe, and say, right, that's the area I want to have a think about. You know, what actions could I take to improve that area? That, that would be my, my recommendation there. 
Um, I just love this quote uh, from this book. What got you here won't get you there. And that's it comes down to what I was saying about forgiving yourself as well. You know, all that hard work and everything you put into your career to get to where you are now is brilliant and never beat yourself up about that. It got you here. But will it get you to where you want to be for the rest of your career, the rest of your life? And I would suggest it possibly won't. Um, so think about what it is that you need to do going forward. So smart people know what they need to do, but they need to know what they need to stop doing. I think that's that's a really um, big takeaway from the book. So almost think about creating a, a to stop list for yourself rather than a to do list. So what I want you to do, having listened to, to, to this webinar, is think about, um, you know, the belief that you identified at the beginning, you know, out of that one to five list. What is your belief or your challenge around self-care? What is it that you believe right now that might be stopping you from doing anything um, in relation to improving your self-care? And think about, again, you can think about that wheel and where you identify that there's areas that you might want to work on. Think about what you might do as a result of today. What might be your priority? What might be your action that you can take? Because what I want you to do is, you know, not let this profession chew you up and spit you out. That's <laughs> That was the point of this image. It was nice to just get this in. We went to the zoo this year and took this one. Um, my eldest son was actually in the jaws of the dinosaur at one point. But um, yeah, this makes my point. Don't let your career chew you up and spit you out. Um, what could you do instead? Think about the things we've talked about today. If you haven't got a copy of my book, The Authentic Lawyer, go and grab yourself one on Amazon. It's free on Kindle Unlimited and £12 um, on Prime. So you can have it by the next day. Um, there is plenty in there. It's full of what I did to go from chronic stress to build the three businesses I've got now, working a hell of a lot less hours and earning a lot less money, a lot less, a lot more money. Um, but just generally having a life that I look back and think, oh, my God, thank goodness that terrible period happened to me, because if it hadn't, I wouldn't be where I am now. You know, all the tools, everything I learned is in that book. Um, so go and grab yourself a copy of that. If you want to do more than that, then have a word with me about some of our weekend retreats um, that we've started running this year that have been absolutely fantastic. So think Spa go Golf Hotel coaching sessions, time on your own, time with other fantastic people, um, working on you, but having some time away as well. Um, think all those things and, and that's what you get there on those retreats. So thank you very much. And as always, if you've got any questions or any feedback or any comments um, from today, then do get in touch with me. You can find me on LinkedIn or you can drop me an email to hannah at authenticallyspeaking.co.uk and I'll be very happy to help. Oh, I don't know what I did there. I lost myself in the picture. <laughs> I don't know how to get it back. Anyway, I'm still here. Um, I th this is.